Hello and welcome to this session on Essayist Perkipi, To Be is to be Perceived. Esse est per kipi, which means to be is to be perceived, is a central statement of George Berkeley's idealism. Would the universe exist if there were no minds to perceive its existence? George Berkeley stands that the universe could not exist without minds to perceive its existence. What size would the universe be if there were no minds to perceive its existence? Here is the answer. It would not be any size because the notion of size comes from a perceiving mind. Since the universe without minds to perceive it would not be any particular size, it therefore would not exist. That is, it would possess no size. Everything that we know about the universe is relative to our minds. So without our minds, everything we know the universe to be would not exist. Therefore, Berkeley's idealism is true and the opposing positions of naturalism and physicalism are false. Naturalism and physicalism are irrational. All the qualities attributed to objects are sense qualities. Thus, hardness is a sensing of a resistance to a striking action, and heaviness is a sensation of muscular effort when, for example, holding an object in one's hand just as blueness is a quality of visual experience. But those qualities exist only while they are being perceived by some subject or spirit equipped with sense organs. The 18th century Anglo-Irish empiricist George Berkeley rejected the idea that sense perceptions are caused by material substance, the existence of which he denied. Intuitively, he grasped the truth that to be is to be perceived. The argument is a simple one, but it provoked an extensive and complicated literature and modern idealists considered it irrefutable. The Reciprocity Argument Closely related to the essayist per kipi argument is the contention that subject and object are reciprocally dependent upon each other. It is impossible to conceive of a subject without an object since the essential meaning of being a subject is being aware of an object and that of being an object is being an object to a subject, that relation being absolutely and universally reciprocal. Consequently, every complete reality is always a unity of subject and object, that is, an immaterial idea, a concrete universal. The mystical argument. In this argument, the idealist holds that in the individual's most immediate experience, that of his own subjective awareness, the intuitive self can achieve a direct apprehension of ultimate reality, which reveals it to be spiritual. Thus, the mystic bypasses normal cognition, feeling that, for metaphysical probings, the elaborate process of mediation interposed between sense objects and their perceptions reduce its reliability as compared with the direct grasp of intuition. It is significant that the claims of that argument have been made by numerous thinkers in varying degrees, idealistic and mystical, living in different periods and in different cultures. In ancient Greece, for example, it was made by Plato, to whom the final leap to the form of the good was mystical in nature. In Indian Hindu Vedanta philosophy, it was made by the 8th century monistic theologian Shankara and by the 11th century dualistic Brahmin theist Ramanuja. In Buddhism, the claims were made by the sometimes mystical extreme subjectivism of the Vijnanavada school of Mahayana and in China by the Zen school and by the 7th century scholar Hui Neng, author of its basic classic Liu Tzu Tang Ching. In Islamic lands, it was made by Sufis or mystics, in particular by the 13th century Persian writer Jalaluddin Rumi. And in the West, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was made by several distinguished idolists. In Germany, by the seminal modern theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher. In France, by the evolutionary intuitionist Henry Bergson. By the philosopher of action Maurice Blondel and 
by the Jewish religious existentialist Martin Buber. And in the English-speaking countries by the Scottish metaphysician James Frederick Ferrer and the American Hegelian William E. Hawking. The ontological argument. This famous argument originated as a proof of the existence of God. It occurred to the 11th century thinker St. Anselm of Canterbury as an intuitive insight from his personal religious experience that a being conceived to be perfect must necessarily exist, for otherwise that being would lack one of the essentials of perfection. God's perfection requires his existence. Some idealist philosophers have generalized the argument to prove idealism. They distinguish conceptual essences that exist only in the intellect from categorical essences that actually exist in re or in the thing. Every actual reality, therefore, is a unity of one or more categorical essences and existence. And again, that means that it is an immaterial idea or concrete universal. According to Hegel, the ideality of the finite is the main principle of philosophy. Types of philosophical idealism. Berkeley's idealism is called subjective idealism because he reduced reality to spirits and to the ideas entertained by spirits. In Berkeley's philosophy, the apparent objectivity of the world outside the self was accommodated to his subjectivism by claiming that its objects are ideas in the mind of God. The foundation for a series of more objective idealisms was laid by the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant, whose epochal work, Critique of Pure Reason, in 1781, presented a formalistic or transcendental idealism, so named because Kant thought that the human self or the transcendental ego constructs knowledge out of the sense impressions upon which are imposed certain universal concepts that he called categories. Three systems constructed in Germany in the early 19th century by respectively the moral idealist Johann Gottlieb Pfister, the aesthetic idealist Friedrich Schilling and Hegel, all on a foundation laid by Kant, are referred to as objective idealism, in contrast to Berkeley's subjective idealism. The designations, however, are not consistent and when the contrast with Berkeley is not at issue, Pfister himself is often called a subjective idealist inasmuch as he exalted the subject above the object, employing the term ego to mean God in the two memorable propositions. One, the ego posits itself, and two, the ego posits the non-ego or nature. In contrast to the subjective idealism of Pfister, Schelling's is called an objective idealism and Hegel's is called an absolute idealism. All those terms form backgrounds for modern Western idealisms, most of which are based either on Kant's transcendental idealism or on those of Pfister, Schelling or Hegel. Exceptions are those based on other great idealists of the past like Plato, Plotinus, Spinoza, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and others. A revised form of Spinoza's spiritual monism, for example, which held that reality is one substance to be identified with God, was formulated by the idealist logician H. H. Joachim, a follower of Bradley. Unwilling to accept any of the above titles, one school of modern idealists adopted the motto Back to Kant and were thus called Kantian idealists. Edward Kayard, who imported German idealism into England, and the German proponent of the philosophy of as if, Hans Weihinger, who held that much of human's so-called knowledge reduces to pragmatic fictions were Kantian idealists or Kantian transcendentalists. On that tradition are based the idealisms of the austerely religious essayist Thomas Carlyle in Sartus Resartus in 1833 and of the New England transcendentalism of Ralph Waldo Emerson. It must be stated, however, that Kant preferred the name critical idealism to that of transcendental idealism. Another group of idealists adopting the motto from Kant forward founded the so-called Marburg School of Neo-Kantian idealism. They rejected the idealisms of Pfister, Schilling and Hegel and the classical Newtonian dynamics 
presupposed by Kant and build instead upon the new quantum and relativity theories of modern physics. Founded in the late 19th century by Hermann Cohen, champion of a new interpretation of Kant and his colleague, the Platonic scholar Paul Nator, who applied Kant's critical method to humanistic as well as to scientific studies, the school underwent a remarkable development, especially under the leadership of Cassirer, who was noted for his profound analysis of human beings as animals that create culture through a unique capacity for symbolic representation. Theistic idealism was founded by the 19th century medical instructor Rudolf Hermann Lodze, who became a broadly learned metaphysician and whose theory of the world ground in which all things find their unity was widely accepted by theistic philosophers and Protestant theologians. For Lodze, the world ground is a transcendental synthesis of an evolutionary world process, which is both mechanical and teleological. It is an infinite spiritual being or God. In England, the absolute idealism of T. H. Green, a philosopher influenced chiefly by Plato and Kant, was shared by his disciple, the more Hegelian thinker Bernard Bosanquet, whose views were based upon Lotte's idealism, and by Bradley, the somewhat skeptical metaphysician of the movement. Theistic absolutism was represented by a pioneer of modern philosophical theology, F. R. Tennant, and by the German-American theologian, Paul Tillich. It differed from the personalistic form of absolute idealism in accepting the traditional theological monotheism that is essential to Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions. It revived classical arguments for the existence of God that were rejected by Kant and appealed to advances in the physical, biological, and behavioral sciences to support those revisions. The cosmological argument, for example, was restated as the continuing relation of the cosmos to a world ground that is spiritual in a sense. Thus, the concept of God at the first cause is rejected. The concept of the fitness of the environment to life and to human history and other scientific concepts was used to modernize the teleological argument. Nevertheless, all of that revision was kept within the framework of idealistic metaphysics and epistemology. A theistic spiritual pluralism, which interprets reality in terms of a multitude of interacting psychic monads or elementary units, was developed by the English philosopher James Ward. On the other hand, an atheistic spiritual pluralism, which holds that reality consists entirely of individual minds and their contents, was exposed by the Cambridge Hegelian J. M. Ellis MacTaggart. During the late 19th century, a movement known as American Hegelian Idealism arose in the United States. It found vigorous early expression in the work of W. T. Harris, a central figure in a Midwestern group of scholars known as the St. Louis School. In its later development, American Idealism split into two branches. One of the aforementioned Bradley Bosanquet type and a second of the Royce Hawking type so-called because it was founded by Royce and developed by his disciple Hawking. The American philosopher of religion, Borden Parker Bowne, founded another important American school, that of personalism, or Kantian and Lodzin-based variety of theistic idealism, similar to the spiritual pluralism of Ward. To the above types should be added the vitalism or creative evolutionism of Bergson, which first found in the apprehension of subjective time an arguably more valid insight into reality than in that of an objective space-time order, and then extending this metaphysics to the cosmic level, claimed to discern there an idealistic elan vital or vital impetus that is more fundamental than matter, which subsequently appeared in the role of a husk bone of the mechanization of the elan. In the same tradition, the voluntarism of Blondel, a unique theory of belief in God as a live option that must be deliberately willed by the self before it can be found to be true in experience, was an important contribution to idealistic philosophy. 
The Spanish philosopher Miguel de Unamuno y Hugo developed a unique type of idealism more literary than philosophical. He stressed the significance of each individual and argued for personal immortality. Alfred North Whitehead, noted for his early 20th century collaboration with Bertard Russell in mathematical logic and for his process philosophy, who was profoundly influenced by Bradley, created an original idealistic philosophy of science, a highly complicated form of metaphysical idealism. And the American metaphysician Charles Hartshorne was a representative of Whiteheadian idealism, although rightly claiming originality. Epistemological idealism of which the Kantian scholar Norman Kemp Smith's work Prolegomena to an Idealist Theory of Knowledge that came out in 1924 is an excellent example covers all idealistic theories of epistemology or knowledge. Berkeley versus Locke In his early 20s, young George Berkeley had read Locke's essay concerning human understanding and had found it to be eminently sensible and persuasive. As regards those last two questions that Locke had posed, however, Berkeley was unconvinced that Locke's answers had been adequately thought out. Locke's two questions and his answers had been thus. Can we know that objects continue to exist even when they are not being perceived by anyone? Locke's answer was, well, perhaps we cannot be absolutely certain of their continued existence during the times when they are not being perceived, but common sense tells us that, in all probability, they do continue to exist even when they are not being perceived. The second question was, and can we know that objects exist even when they are being perceived? And Locke's answer, Surely, no one would be so skeptical as to hold that we cannot know objects exist when they are being directly perceived. Common sense tells us that, of course, we can know the objects exist during the intervals that we are directly perceiving them. Berkeley was not convinced that Locke's answers to these two questions were precisely accurate. Berkeley proposed to think through these two questions as clearly as he possibly could following all the principles of good common sense and relying only on what our actual experience clearly teaches us. The two books in which he articulates his examination of these two questions are The Principles of Human Knowledge in 1710 and Three Dialogues between Hylas and Philonus in 1713. The Three Dialogues is a shorter work and many people find the argument as expressed in the dialogues to be simpler and easier to follow. For Berkeley, the question came down to what we mean when we say that something exists. He analyzes this question from several different angles and concludes that all we can possibly mean when we say that a thing exists is that the thing is being perceived. To exist and to be perceived for Berkeley came down to the same thing. To be means to be perceived or esse est per kipi is Berkeley's famous principle. If this is what we mean by to be, then clearly things exist only when they are being perceived. Then Berkeley asks whether physical matter exists. His answer will clearly be that it can be said to exist if we can perceive it, but that it cannot be said to exist if we cannot perceive it. So the question comes down to whether we can perceive physical matter or not. Now the answer to this question might seem pretty obvious to most of us, but Berkeley asks us to look at the question more closely. When we say that we perceive physical matter, what exactly is it that we claim to be perceiving? I see this beautiful little red agate that I found on the beach yesterday, for example, but what exactly am I sensing? I am actually having a complex sense perception that includes a sensation of hard, reddish, a certain shape and size, a certain smoothness, etc. Thus, what I am actually perceiving are sensations, which Locke, but not Berkeley, thought were caused by qualities, but not physical matter as such. So according to Berkeley, all those qualities I am perceiving, the sensations of redness, hardness, shape, etc., all actually exist only in my mind, not out in a, some hypothesized external world. 
So if we perceive only sensations and do not ever actually perceive physical matter, then according to Berkeley, we cannot claim to experience physical matter and thus have no basis for believing that physical matter exists. That, in a much abbreviated nutshell, is Berkeley's analysis of the question of whether physical matter exists or not. He says we have absolutely no empirical evidence that matter does exist since we never experience it directly or even indirectly. So what sort of existence are there in the world according to Berkeley? You will recall that Locke believed that there are four kinds of existence. Material things, perceptions, minds and God. Bishop George Berkeley believes the only kind of existence are perceptions and minds. He believes in God of course, he is an Anglican bishop after all, but he sees God as infinite mind. Thus the list of existence for Berkeley would look something like this. Minds which include finite human minds, God's infinite mind and perceptions that exist in those minds. Thus. For Berkeley, no physical objects or physical matter exist at all. What we consider to be things do continue to exist, though they are not made of physical matter, even when no humans are directly perceiving them, according to Berkeley. And the reason for their continued existence is that God's infinite mind continues to perceive these things, that is, continues to generate these perceptions, even when we do not perceive them. George Berkeley is therefore not considered as realist. Since he does not hold that there is a physical world existing out there, but is instead said to be an idealist, that is, one who believes that everything that exists is ideas and perceptions and minds. Berkeley comes to his conclusion not by any esoteric path or religious tradition or scientific method, but simply by carefully following out what common sense and experience teaches us if we listen to them closely and examine them carefully. David Hume was convinced that we do of course experience sensation and perceptions, but he believed that both Locke and Berkeley left two major concepts entirely unexamined. These two concepts, both of them absolutely fundamental to the way we think about things, and both of them almost entirely unquestioned by any philosophers up until Hume's time are two of the most fundamental assumptions in human thought. These two fundamental concepts are cause and effect and the notion of self, identity and mind. Hume will examine these two concepts with a highly sharp-witted and analytically critical vengeance. Let us summarize what we have discussed so far. Berkeley denied the existence of matter as a metaphysical substance, but did not deny the existence of physical objects such as apples or mountains. This basic claim of Berkeley's thought, his idealism, is sometimes and somewhat derisively called immaterialism or occasionally subjective idealism. In Principles, he wrote, using a combination of Latin and English, esse es per cipi, which means to be is to be perceived. The phrase appears associated with him in authoritative philosophical sources. According to him, human knowledge is reduced to two elements, that of spirits and of ideas. In contrast to ideas, a spirit cannot be perceived. A person's spirit, which perceives ideas, is to be comprehended intuitively by inward feeling or reflection. For Berkeley, we have no direct idea of spirits, albeit we have good reason to believe in the existence of other spirits, for their existence explains the purposeful regularities we find in experience. Now you can try to answer the following questions. What do you mean by esse est per cipi, or to be is to be perceived? What are the idealistic perspectives of George Berkeley? give a general overview of the idealistic philosophy of Berkeley. What are the important works of George Berkeley? What is a major ideological difference between Locke and Berkeley? What is the ontological argument of idealism? Who formed an original idealistic philosophy of science? How is it different from other forms of idealism? Hope that you may go through the reference book for further reading.
Berkeley's Revolution in Vision, written by Atherton and Margaret, published by the Cornwall University Press in 1990. George Berkeley, Idlism and the Man, by D. Berman, published by Clarendon Press, 1994. Berkeley, an Introduction, by J. Dancy, published by Blackwell Publications, 1987. Berkeley's Ontology, by R. G. Muleman, published by Hackett in 1992. Berkeley's Thought, by G. S. Pappas, published by Cornwall University Press, 2000. George Berkeley, The Arguments of the Philosophers, by Pitcher, published by Rutledge and Keegan Paul, 1977. Berkeley's World, An Examination of the Three Dialogues, by T. Stoneham, published by Oxford University Press in 2002. Berkeley, The Philosophy of Immaterialism, by I. C. Tipton, published by Midwin in 1974. Thank you for watching this program. We can meet again soon with another topic. Till then, take care.